Well, from all indications, it looks like I'm live. Welcome. I'm Greg Osby, saxophonist. For any of those of you who don't know me or my work or anything about me or my work, I'll give you a brief uh, summary of who I am and how I arrived on this platform. Uh, I'm originally from St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I began playing uh, clarinet in 1972, clarinet and flute. Of course, you know, the uh, junior high school situation, sixth grade, um, no ambition, but very curious. And um, I guess maybe one year to one year and a half later, I got my hands on an alto saxophone and things really kicked in. And um, my abilities on those instruments accelerated really rapidly because the more I put into it, the more um, that was revealed. And um, so much so to the degree that uh, at a very young age, you know, tender age of 14, I was invited to play in a lot of uh, local blues bands, soul bands, R&B, funk, those kind of you know, groove based bands. And, um, you know, this is around 1974. I was all of 14 years old. And uh, of course, the youngest person in the band, you know, being governed and looked, looked out um, for, you know, by the older guys in the band. It was a great learning uh, situation, um, hands on, if you will. And I think a year later, um, that was the first time I heard Charlie Parker. Now, prior to that, I mean, I was playing, you know, one chord groove based things. But uh, when I heard Charlie Parker, that was the first time I heard, I, I recognized, you know, that uh, possibility of uh, expression on the instrument. And it just, you know, it, it changed everything because I didn't even know that the instrument was capable of doing that and, uh, you know, negotiating music in that way. So then I was on a quest to, you know, to, to, to reveal, you know, what that meant and, and, and how to do it. And, um, you know, all the while by playing in these local bands, I would say my development took a very, very unusual turn uh, because, um, you know, we learned everything by ear. And then in those days they had these turntables, they were belt drive turntables. You know, it was a rubber band that, that turned, you know, the platter. And the one that we learned our music on was very, very temperamental depending on the humidity or how cold it was outside or the, you know, the intense heat, you know, whatever variables contributed to how fast or how slow that turntable spun. And so consequently, we learned all of the songs in the wrong keys, either too fast or too slow. So whereas this may have been an issue for people with perfect pitch or people who, you know, were sticklers, you know, for, for getting things right, for me, it, it allowed me to develop a facility in some of the alternative keys, the keys with multiples of sharps and multiples of flats, typically the dip, difficult keys that musicians avoid. So I, I, I developed a facility in these keys. And, and so when I graduated to more uh, challenging music later, you know, I had a very no fear approach because everything was on, on an equal plane. So that served me well. It was a very unorthodox way to learn as I didn't really have any personal teachers. So a lot of things, you know, I, I did by trial and error or by experimentation or just, you know, jumping in head first. So it was, it was a really, a, a really, you know, good uh, learning course. And um, in 1978, I, I went to Howard University got a full scholarship to go there. Coincidentally, you know, the, the head of the department there, he was the, the same person that taught me how to play clarinet in junior high school. So he got that gig and he offered me that uh, free scholarship, which was a godsend because I didn't know how I was going to pay for college at that point. So I got to Howard University, stayed there for a couple of years and visited a, a college in Boston and um, interface with a lot of you know other young hopefuls, you know, people who were going for you know the same things, had the same dreams and aspirations. And I played in a couple of uh, ensembles there. And somehow, you know, those T 
teachers for, of those ensembles. They wrote letters of recommendation to the to the dean of admissions, and they sent for me. He said, you know, would you like to come to to this school? And uh, so I transferred and transitioned to Boston for a couple of years. And during those couple of years, I made regular treks back and forth to New York because it was really cheap. And there was a, an abundance of jam sessions and home sessions that I could participate in. And I could see who was who and who was doing what. And I could gauge where I stood, you know, in the, um, you know, in the ranks, so to speak. And so by the time I did, uh, you know, make the, the, the official move to New York in fall of 80, 82, spring of 83, it was kind of a slow transition. People thought I, they thought I already lived there, which was the plan. So that, that worked out really well. And at that period, um, work was very plentiful in New York. There were a lot of clubs, a lot of jam sessions, and it was very common to see uh, one or more of the established elders in those clubs at night, either scouting or checking out you know, young talent so that they could either hire them or make uh, recommendations. So it was a very, 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 um, you know, rich time to be in town. And, you know, a lot of these people, they were very um, generous with information. If you ask them something and, you know, they would indulge, you know, younger players, you know, who was serious. And um, it was just great. There, were, um, The scene in Europe, you know, was, was abundant, you know, with activity. There was a lot happening. Um, you know, and there was a very, very um, fruitful and healthy uh, energy, uh, the atmosphere of, of exchange, you know, amongst young, you know, younger musicians, my peers, um, very, very liberal, very open minded. And there was a lot of uh, different genres and, and, and directions in music that you could, you know, very well uh, avail yourself of. And, you know, you can play in, you know, various you know, reggae groups and salsa groups and different, you know, hip hop groups, you know, which was emerging, funk and soul, as well as, you know, different um, you know, African, you know, rhythm based music, uh, cultural based music, folkloric bands. Um, and, you know, once again, if you had your thing together and you had prepared for it, um, within, you know, you would be a sought after side person. And, um, you know, so it, it really was about uh, being prepared, uh, having an open mind, a willing spirit, and, and being um, flexible and um, being able to adapt to, uh, you know, variances in approach, uh, composition, concept. Um, and also being able to to bring it, you know, when called upon to do it, you know. So those who did the work, and who knuckled down, and, and who were serious. I mean, those are the ones who are being still lauded today. They're still being written about. They're still being copied and sought after, because you know, no time was wasted. It was a very, very you know, healthy competition amongst the young musicians. I didn't really feel the generation gap immediately, but the generation gap kind of broadened a bit, you know, as um, younger players start to migrate to New York in, in larger numbers and jobs were, um, you know, were, you know, given to people whether or not they deserved it or whether or not they, they earned it or, or they were worthy. And, you know, but that was a, a determination. That was a subjective determination by people who either weren't working or who weren't being called upon or who just, for whatever reason, you know, didn't think people. But, it, you know, all of it, it created this energy. It created this vibe, you know, and, and spirit that um, post-pandemic, I, I think, you know, we're going to be in that, in that realm that space again, because I kind of feel it, you know, whenever I talk to, to younger players and the frustrations, you know, that they, that they reveal, you know, not being able to express themselves and being immobile, um, being quarantined, you know, it's, it's offered, you know, an, an involuntary uh, opportunity for a lot of people to, to work on things in their own private space, 
in their laboratories. You know, so I think that we're very much on the threshold of um, of a new renaissance, as history has shown us. Show, uh, you know, it's shown us that uh, after every major uh, economic or social upheaval, you know, war, you know, some kind of uh, clash or conflict or strife. Um, you know, the music changes, culture changes. It has to. It's not going to go backwards. It has to go forward. And I don't. I firmly don't believe that uh, things will resume uh, themselves, to, you know, as they were prior to in the situation. So it's, uh, you know, we have uh, a lot to look forward to. We have a lot to, um, to be grateful for. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy to be a willing participant and, and a noble fan of, uh, of, of music and expression by people who, you know, have that, that charge, you know, that who are motivated and who are restless enough to, to work on things and to keep pushing forward. You know, those kind of people don't really need to be prodded. They don't need to be encouraged. They, all they do is, is sit back and, and, and crank out, you know, new directives and, and and they challenge themselves by raising their own artistic bar. And um, these are the people that, that, that I gravitate towards as opposed to those who, I guess the, the best analogy would be, they're like a hamster on a treadmill. You know, they're, they're moving, but they're not moving forward. And so, you know, a lot of these, these people that I'm, I'm referring to, they, they sound good, they're great, and um, it's, you know, overwhelmingly acceptable, but it's not progressive in that sense. So, but there's no rule saying that everybody has to be. There's room for everyone. There's some people who are revisionist in their output. You know, they're historical and they've, um, you know, they've framed themselves, you know, within, you know, the, the you know, the capabilities and the aspects of something, you know, that was uh, presented by others, you know, who preceded us, but they've refined it. So there are some people that do that very well. Then there are some people who live for adventure, for adventure's sake. You know, everything is, um, you know, by the skin of their teeth, as they say. And, um, you know, that can be regarded as reckless by some people because sometimes it sounds unprepared and um, the results may not be optimal all the time. But again, you know, there's a large umbrella that we uh, reside under and there's room and space for everyone to, to do their own thing. And I, you know, and I would put emphasis on that. I, I would like for us to return to a, um, you know, an era where everybody's doing their own thing. So there's no mimicking, there's no pantomiming, and there's no copying. I, I, I would say that uh, the best illustration of this, well, for myself, would be possibly the year 1959. You know, when, um, you know, there was a, a, a major, you know, element, you know, in the wind, you know, that, that that signal that a, that a huge change was coming, and you can you can see it by some of the landmark recordings that were released in 1959, uh, you know, or 58, 59, you know, around in there, you know, the um, you know kind of blue, uh, you know, Ornette Coleman, you know, this is our music, um, Shape of Jazz to Come, Mingus, uh, um, you know, these kind of things, Giant Steps by John Coltrane, all of this music by you know, radically different artists, you know, who forged their own uh, framework of uh, presentation. That to me is what I like to see. I, I saw a, um, a marquee one time. I was rehearsing with the uh, esteemed uh, pianist, the, the late, great Jackie Byer, you know, for a series of duo concerts. I think I may have been maybe 26, you know, 25 or 26 years old, you know, in the presence of, of his greatness. And uh, at his house, he had a, a marquee banner. And it was from uh, the Village Gate. 
and it may have you know been the early to the mid '60s or whatever, but it was um, promoting you know either a night or a series of music that they had because they had the, you know uh, upstairs and downstairs you know venues at the gate, you know, and they would happen either at the same time or they would be staggered. And as I, as I recall, I, I think it might have been Eric Dolphy, uh, Rossan Roland Kirk, uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, and maybe Horace Silver or, you know, Charles Mingus or something like that. But it was there were four groups, four different groups. They all sounded you know, completely different. And they performed in the same venue in the same night. Now, when and where have, have we ever seen that happen? in our lifetimes. So this, I, mean, I know that it's not cost effective, you know, for a lot of promoters to to, uh, to present something like this because they had to, they would have to pay for different bands or, you know, or, you know, I don't know how would, they would be able to orchestrate that, but um, at least, you know, and, you know, but there are some uh, venues that do that uh, in, in New York, but, you know, they're largely, you know, up and comers. They don't do headliners. They don't do veterans that way, you know, which would be a larger draw. But, you know, possibly, you know, these veterans would probably ask for so much money that, you know, it just wouldn't be cost effective. But, you know, these are the things that um, that happen, you know, during uh, the heyday of the music, you know, when it uh, enjoyed, you know, the strongest uh, support ship and patronage. Um, I guess rock music or the advent of the Beatles or the British invasion or whatever kind of pulled the rug out of uh, up under that. I guess promoters saw that they can make a lot more money and create stampedes, you know, screaming girls chasing, you know, groups down the street, you know, and, and, and fill venues, you know, to the rafters as opposed, you know, this music that was becoming um, increasingly cerebral and abstract and difficult for people to process. Again, you know, in terms of balance, in terms of uh, tolerance, I'm hopeful that we'll get back to a point where, you know, no genre of music dominates the airwaves or dominates, you know, the um, the, the tours or, or, or promotions or anything like that. Everybody's, you know, in it for a buck. And it's almost as if uh, the word artist or artistic you know, or bad words, because that, that puts you in the, in the categorization of, you know, being difficult, unyielding, um, you know, uncommercial. You know, I'm of the belief that you can sell just about anything if you promote it properly. We have at our access social media. A lot of promoters don't do a lot of prom promoting anymore. Um, a lot of, or most artists are um, completely uh, self-sufficient and they're you know, one man armies, so to speak. They're wearing multiples of hats. I mean, because uh, a lot of uh, artists can't find representation. They can't get a manager. They can't get an agent. They can't book tours. They're doing door gigs and all the while they're sitting on multiples of degrees, you know, bachelor's and and uh, master's degrees and even doctor, doctorate degrees. Um, so artists have to promote themselves. They have to be their own publicist. They have to write uh, press releases. They have to pay for their own recordings and, and the mixing and the mastering and uh, the manufacturing of those releases, if they're going to do that at all. A lot of people do virtual releases that are for download only. Um, then they have to try to find work. They have to send out uh, bulletins and notifications of where they're going to perform. And um, Sometimes it works against against that artist because if they bombard their mailing list with these promotions, well, then people in turn sometimes they feel assaulted by that, and then they you know they um, send things directly to the to the trash bin, or they don't 
acknowledge it. They don't read it at all. It's a it's a fine art to promoting yourself and and bringing attention to yourself and, and, and giving yourself shine without becoming a pest, without becoming annoying. But these are the things that I talk about regularly, you know, during my lectures and master classes, residencies, and also, you know, with my personal instruction, because um, it's, you know, it's important, you know, to, to lend a helping hand and in, 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 information wise to people, because I feel personally obligated to do that because all of the elders, did it for me. And there was no um, hesitation, you know, from people like, I don't know, the Dizzy Gillespie, Jim Hall, Andrew Hill, Jack D. Jeanette, Joe Henderson, Eddie Harris, Wayne Shorter, a lot of people, any, anybody that I asked um, of, you know, their time and, you know, the information, they were very, very willing and very open you know, because I guess they recognize my seriousness and earnestness. And, and so I think that needs to be um, heightened in terms of bringing the generations together and leading these people, in the, uh, younger people in the right direction so that they don't have to deal with the hard knocks and they can circumvent you know, a, a lot of trials that, you know, unfortunately many of us endured for their benefit, that's that's why that's why it works. So, um, I guess in, in 1987, I recorded my first um, you know, my first outing as a leader with a, 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 a German label called JMT, and it was distributed uh, internationally to Polygram Records. And in 1989, I signed with Blue Note Records. Uh, until, and I was with them until 2005 or 2006 in there. And um, at that point, I was touring with the Grateful Dead and, and they had these people in the audience who were taping their concert. And I, and I, and I asked uh, Phil Lesh, I said, hey man, these people are taping. And he said, yeah, you know, they distribute the tapes, everything. And, and so our, our music is in circulation, whether we're on tour or not. And so you should think about this. You should think about owning owning your prod, product. You should think about giveaways. You should think about building a fan base by giving them incentives. So that's when you know, you know, the uh, my association with Blue Note ended after a very long and fruitful t tenure, and I started my own recording company called Inner Circle Music, and um, I use this as a as a hub for young people, you know, to meet and to interface with one another and to exchange whatever they have to offer or to contribute. And uh, it's, it's a, uh, an intersection, you know, kind of a, a crossroads and a, a platform, you know, for expression and a catapult because a lot of people have come through the company and, and have recorded and uh, have gone on to, to bigger and better situations, which is, the plan, just what the doctor ordered, as they say. And um, so Inner Circle Music, www.innercirclemusic.com. Check that out and check out our roster. We have some, some wonderful artists doing great and inspiring things. And um, I guess, you know, as, as we near wrapping this up, I just want to... Um, to uh, to speak, you know, to younger musicians in terms of uh, their personal development. I think this is this is imperative that the younger uh, players try or make the attempt to to start groups again because right now we have a lot of Indians, you no, know, a lot of chiefs. But no tribes, you know, Indians and chiefs, you know, but no tribe. We need to to have groups that that have a, a, an objective, you know, sonically and conceptually, you know. So and and try to keep those groups together because that I, I think that's what's missing. We have people scrambling from job to job. A lot of journeymen, uh, people, you know, jumping, you know, from band to band. There's really no unified sound, 
there's no uh, identifiable characteristics in in music that 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 identify a band like say Cannonball Adderley's band or Horace Silver's band or Miles Davis's band or Charles Mingus or Duke Ellington or whatever these bands they have particulars uh, building blocks you know that that characterize you know the the aspirations of of the composer or the leader and he handpicked the right people to interpret you know his means and um, there are a few you know people uh, in in the contemporary realm who who do that and who've stayed the course but I, I would like to hear that a lot more you know I would also uh, implore that younger players they develop a stronger online presence um, and possibly you know engage directly you know with their audiences and patrons and to expand their their base of support. It's really important. And um, that's, that, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, where, where we're going. You know, if the pandemic didn't show us anything, it showed us that, that we can be totally shut down. And if you only have one iron in the fire and that iron gets cold and you don't have anything else going for yourself, you know, you will have an even greater struggle. So, you know, just diversify your abilities your talents and, and your your output. So, oh, I have a question from Janice Grice. Um, what's in the works for me is I, I'm about 90% uh, complete with my latest uh, CD project. And it'll be the first release since possibly, yeah, since 2008. I haven't uh, released a CD in a very long time. I didn't really feel the need for it. Uh, I've been able to work steadily without a release, you know, traveling with my bands and as a guest artist and, you know, lecturing and teaching and things like that. But I have such a stockpile of, of, of uh, new compositions because I never stop writing that um, it's time. And I've, you know, just been getting demands, you know, from the people that follow me, um, students, you know, current and former students, fans, and, you um, so yes, it's about ready, and I'm very, very proud of it because these these uh, compositions will be my literal masterwork because I've been chipping away at them for some time. I'm very, very proud of it, and I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to share that, you know, when it's ready. And um, yes, Facebook user it says uh, diversify your abilities. Absolutely, yeah. As they, as they say, you know, have more irons in the fire. So, um, you know, they're all hot. You know, develop your 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 um, or, or, or oratory skills so that you're able to, to lecture and to and you're, you're able to teach. You're able to uh, relay, you know, your you know your ped pedagogy, and you're you're able to. Score for films and score for poets and score for dancers and things like this. It's, it's you know it's, it, it it goes far beyond just being a great musician, a soloist. You know you want to be uh, capable of doing a lot more things. And there goes our, our uh, alert. So once again, um, it's been my pleasure to uh, meet with uh, everyone who's uh, in attendance today on this forum. Uh, big shout out to, to Gail Boyd for the, for the invitation. It was my pleasure. And I hope to see everybody in the very near future.